Hi, this is Jazz Obrick, and welcome to my Talking Guitar podcast with Michael Anthony. In 1974, Mike joined Van Halen. By the time of our interview seven years later, he was regularly delighting concert goers with an extended bass solo that climaxed with his jumping on his instrument. Most of the time, though, Mike played a supporting role. As Eddie said at the time of our interview, Mike Anthony is a damn good bass player. When my brother Al and Mike are playing, it's an open world for me. I can do whatever I want. They're right there backing me up, feeding me. Like the Van Halen brothers, Michael came from a musical family. He was born in Chicago in 1955, and his father played, played trumpet in big bands. Michael began on trumpet around age seven and took up bass in junior high. His family moved to Los Angeles when he was in his early teens, and Michael played trumpet in his high school marching band. In the early 1970s, he enrolled at Pasadena City College to study brass instruments and piano. Outside of classes, he played bass in a trio called Snake. In 1974, he met Alex Van Halen in a jazz improvisation class, and he was soon invited to jam with Alex and Eddie. After a three-hour session, they asked him to join them in their new band, Van Halen. When we spoke, Michael had already played on the first four Van Halen albums and done several tours. And what would prove to be one of his most in-depth early interviews, we discussed his musical upbringing, his instrument collection, stage setup, playing techniques, and his extended solo. Michael also delved into the limitations of playing hard rock, described how the band arranged songs, and talked about differences between his studio and stage playing. Near the end, he spoke about the benefits and pitfalls of success and offered advice for young players. Our conversation took place on July 22nd, 1981. How much time do we have? Uh, well, that's pretty much kind of open. Okay. Can you uh, give me a little bit about your background, like uh, when and where you were born and uh, when you started playing? Sure. Uh, I was born in uh, Chicago. You want to know the year and stuff, too? Yeah. What oh, day? Uh, 1955, June 20th. And uh, actually, I started playing, uh, my father used to play in uh, big bands. A long time ago. Play bass? In, in Chicago. No, he played trumpet. And so when I was about seven years old, I had a trumpet stuck in my mouth. So that was actually the first instrument I began playing. And uh, when I got into junior high school is when I actually picked up my first bass and started messing around on that. Some guys wanted to get together and form a rock band. And so I think I got some uh, real old uh, uh, Victoria guitar. I don't know if you ever heard of those. No. It was, like, it was like a $15 guitar we got at the pawn shop. An electric? Yeah. Real cheap little electric. And I used to use like uh, just the, I took the last two strings off and just kind of strummed around on that for a while. And uh, I, uh, from there, I just started playing in different, all different kinds of bands. Did you ever have lessons? No, not, well, okay, I, w I was also... At the same time, I was still playing trumpet. Like, I played the junior high marching band and concert band and concert orchestra. Is this in Chicago? No. This was uh, right after I moved out to L.A. How old were you then? Uh, at 14. And uh, I actually played trumpet all the way up through, uh, I did two years of it in uh, college also. Well, where'd you go to college at? And, uh, well, I just went to uh, Pasadena City College out there. That's actually where I met the Van Halen guys. And... Uh, uh, then I started taking like uh, uh, I took piano because I wanted to learn how to read bass because I could only I only used to read like you know the uh, uh, treble clef and so I started taking piano and from that I I got into like a little bit of jazz improv and uh, uh, then I switched my major over to music. Do you think that having an education in the in the in the formal side of music helps your uh, help has helped your your bass playing or your career? Yeah, I think in some ways it does. I mean, like, you know, the jumping around and all that, you know, you just get that from 
you know, watch what everyone else does and stuff like that. But uh, it helped me a lot. Like, actually, uh, the jazz background that I got from playing bass and a lot of jazz and prop stuff, even though, like, playing behind Ed, I'm kind of restricted and I got to keep pretty much straight, you know, because he gets, he gets off real wild at times. Uh, there's still a lot, like, from that that I could apply to what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And that was what was most helpful out of the formal training that I got. A, a lot of the other stuff, like the harmony classes that I took, those are all helpful, like, uh, when we're doing, figuring out different harmonies and stuff like that. But uh, basically, it was jazz that uh, that helped me, you know, I got the most out of bass. What do you think is the most important thing for a young guy who's starting out on bass to learn? Mm, I was going to say take up piano. <laughs> really? Why? Uh, I don't know. To me, that's that's like the universal instrument. You know, and when, once I started playing it, I really started to appreciate music a lot more. Yeah, it develops you know, kind of, Yeah, it kind of really broadened, you know, everything out. From there, I could, like, uh, you know, I started thinking around with uh, different instruments, you know, and stuff like that. Well, but, do, you, do you play other instruments besides but, piano and bass? And yeah, I play trumpet? trumpet, and I play a little bit of guitar. And, uh... Let's see. Well, I, I played some like uh, trombone and you know a lot of the brass instruments and stuff like that. Do you play any bass styles that, that aren't represented on any of your albums? Uh, yeah. And usually the the style that I play, the, like the style that I play live, is almost completely different than what I play on album. Could you describe the difference? Okay, like on the album, uh, you need that real solid rhythm, you know, especially like when Ed does a, a solo. And uh, basically everything that we do in the studio is live. And so you don't want it to sound like uh, three different people playing three different songs, you know, when you go off on a solo. So like Alex and I work out a real solid rhythm thing so that when Ed does go into a solo and the, that rhythm guitar does drop out, that, you know, it's, there's still a solid foundation pumping away. And live, I can get away playing a little bit more you know, going off and doing a little more of a lead type of playing at, at certain times, which I can't do on the album. Would you say that your your playing is constantly expanding? Are you are you learning new things all the time? Yeah, I am now. Uh, uh, for a while, like you, you get into a into a rut. Sometimes, like for like maybe a month or two months, I'll get into a rut when we're gigging really heavy. You know, and I don't get out and listen to any other kind of new stuff, but. Uh, uh, a lot of times, like, I'm always hunting for, for new basses, for different kinds of basses. I'm not like Ed, down to the point to where I, I build my own guitar from scratch. I'll look for something. Uh, I go hunting around, and I'll look for something that's already, you know, in the store, and I'll buy it, and then I'll rip it apart and put my own kind of pickups in it and stuff like that. And and it's, it seems like every time I pick up a different bass, you know, depending on the feel and stuff, it uh, kind of alters my style. So, like, if I, if I start to feel stifled for a while, let's say playing a, uh, a Fender Precision, then I'll, even if like I go and I pick up a jazz bass or something like that where the neck is, you know, even real radically different, uh, I find myself playing a lot of different different licks. And so like I'll change and I'll, I'll play that even if I don't use it on stage. I'll play something like that for a while then. What, what's the extent of your bass collection? Uh, I've got about, hmm, about 14 basses right now. What are your favorites? Uh, well, I, let's see, I just bought an old 63 jazz bass, which I really like. I don't have it out on the road. I got it, like, a, about two weeks before we left to go on the road this year. And, uh, let's see, uh, a long time ago, B.C. Rich built me a bass that was, like, uh, I lived uh, kind of close to their factory, and so I went in there, and they wanted to do a whole endorsement type thing, but I just said, no, hey, you know, I just want to try one of your bases out. And so they built me a built me a base that was like everything that I wanted. What was that? So, well, it's like like the neck. Like I like kind of a, a, a thin neck. Uh, most of my bases, I have the neck shaved from like right in between a precision and a jazz with, and then I like them very round, like a half circle. That's interesting. Do you, what kind of modifications do you usually do to them? Uh, well, okay, like right now, I'm using I'm using Schecter pickups, and uh, I find I just, I just use like the one split uh, P bass style 
check your pickup, and I have that uh, rewound, so it's a little bit more powerful. And uh, I like that right now because it gets a real nice round, full tone live. And uh, I always, uh, at the, the bottom horn, where when you get up to the neck, like around the 24th fret, you know, I always cut that back because one thing I cannot stand, and I don't understand why companies do this, when they build bases like the, like a 24th fret base, they always, the body starts right around the uh, 20th fret, 21st fret. And so, like, whenever I get a base with all that on it, I like to use every fret. And I always have problems, like, playing, you know, the high notes. So I always, first thing I do is I just cut that right away so that I can play all the way up. Do you leave the switching pretty much stock? Uh, yeah, well, when I first buy a base, I'll leave the switching stock. Uh, I used to use a lot of, like, a double pickup thing because I'd use, like, front pickup if I was playing with my fingers and then uh, uh, switch over to, like, the front and back when I, when I was playing with a pick. But now, the way that I've got my, uh, I'm winding my pickups, uh, I just have the one pickup and I just use that. To me, it's a lot simpler than, you know, like, I've tried different bases with all the preamps and stuff like that. And, that, you know, that's all really nice for somebody who's playing in a little club, and, you know, and you can hear it really nice coming out of the amp and you're not playing loud. But, uh, like, for what we're doing on stage, you know, just one pickup that's got the sound, you know, is all you really need. What kind of compensations do you have to make when you're playing at such a, a high volume? Uh, well, the first thing right off the bat, you can't play fast. You can't play what? You can't play too fast, too quick. You lose it? Yeah, like a lot of times like, I'll try to do like a fast lick. And, you know, that's a combination of like the hall, size halls you play and stuff too. But uh, right away, you know, things will start getting muddy, especially if you're doing something that's down low. So uh, I find myself, you know, playing a lot more slower type of stuff live. What, do you use a wireless? Yeah. What kind? Uh, I use Schaefer Vega. Is that mainly be because you move around so much? Yeah. Now, if that, if that breaks down, if I have to use a cord, I feel like I'm in a cage. What, um... What kind of uh, effect setup do you have? Where does your signal go? Um, okay, well, right now I'm running through, okay, I'm using six SBTs on stage. You're using what? Six SBT, Ampeg SBTs, heads, which are all modified. They're like 400 on this one. And uh, I run that through a rack, and uh, in the rack I'm using a, a Roland DC-30. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, it's a Roland DC-30 Chorus Echo. And uh, let's see, I've got an MXR flanger, an uh, ADA flanger, uh, electro harmonics, uh, micro bass synthesizer, and uh, let's see, also an MXR uh, envelope filter, and sometimes I use a DBX boombox. What's that do? It's uh, actually it's, it's it's called a DBX disco boombox, which was originally. Uh, uh, developed for like uh, to put on your stereo when you're playing disco. It it adds a lower harmonic. Oh, I see. And you can synthesize it. And I use that sometimes, like if that's doing something fast, and I'm doing like a one note thing. Now, in your, I saw you play at the Oakland Auditorium, mm -hmm. and in your bass solo, you had the effect that sort of sounded sort of like um, a moving spaceship, or I'm trying to remember. It's in my head, but where you know you were pointing like an airplane or something right like right you were pointing in the direction of the sound how did you create that right okay now that's that's a that's a combination of the uh the echo uh the mxr flanger and the bass synthesizer and i, I use the synthesizer because it's got a uh it's got a sub harmonic on it that sounds really good and it's really clean and uh it's also got like a, squ uh, a square wave that you can change which kind of uh uh, warps the high end, which gives it a real type of sound. And then I use the, uh, uh, the echo just keeps it going, and the flanger, I use that to uh, actually make the effect of the plane type of thing flying by. Oh, I see. And don't ask me how I came up with it, because it's just one that I was just sitting around, and I was just toying with them all together and stuff, and it just came out. Um, do you have to be at a high volume to get it that way? No. Not really, but at the high volume, that's when you really get, like, what I'm, I'm really trying to create is a lot of the, the low end, you know, pumping off the stage and stuff. Yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool effect. <laughs>
Now your bass solo is kind of uh, you kind of aggressive towards your instrument. Yeah. Do you ever wreck anything like that? Yeah, all the time. What do you know? <laughs> what are some of the problems you might do there? Uh, well, every time I smack it on the ground, I'm always I've got a million holes where I'm always replacing strap locks. Uh, all my keys are bent. And, uh, after a while, like the only kind of bases that I can do that to, like if I jump on it, is like a base with, with the neck that goes all the way through the body. If I use the bolt-on neck, it would uh, like deep, it snap right in half. What's the best kind of base to jump on? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've never asked that question. <laughs> Uh, right now I'm using a Yamaha. It's uh, a broad base 2000 that I uh, uh, I received in Japan as a present when Yamaha came and followed uh, Ed and me around a couple of years. I uh, seven uh, 79 tour, I think it was. And uh, at that at that time I thought that was like for just a stock base. I thought that was like the best thing that came out at the time out of all the different bases I was trying. And uh, one thing went into another, just led to me jumping on it. <laughs> It, it's really weird because, like, uh, you know, in the world of, you know, heavy metal or whatever you want to call it, you know, there's the, the guitar hero, and that's basically it, you know. A, a drummer can do a long solo, but, you know, it, it, that even starts to get boring, and that's why Alex does a really nice compact thing. And uh, the bass player is always the one who stands next to the drummer and does nothing. Only somebody who actually plays music can appreciate. I mean, that's where, like, all your... Uh, uh, Jack Bruce's and uh, Tim Bogert's and all them, they're, they're only known by, like, the other musicians, you know, as good rock bass players. And uh, well, our second year, I was doing a thing with a, with a fuzz and doing all kinds of weird stuff. And uh, I think we were in Washington, and uh, the Barbarians had just finished playing before we did. And some kid came running up to me and said, yeah, yeah, Stanley Clark did, like, his 10-minute bass on the world. But, geez, when you got out there, man, you made him sound like shit. It sounded like World War III and all this. And I said to myself, hey, this is one of the typical kids, you know. Like, I'd love to get out there and just, you know, show all my chops and just play. But, uh, you know, the kind of, I said, well, this is what we're playing to and this is what they appreciate. And this year, since I've been uh, jumping on my bass, I swear I cannot believe the compliments that I get from different people, and, you know, it, it kind of throws me for a loop, too. It's fun. I'm having a good time doing it. Boy, that's a... I mean, I can always, you know, I'm not out to jump after any kind of number one bass player pulls or whatever, you know, and, you know, I, I can sit home and, and, you know, play what I like to play or, you know, or just get together and jam with some friends, and, you know. How do you uh, arrange the material with the band before you do an album? Uh... Okay, well, usually, like when we start out, Ed usually starts out with a basic lick, and a lot of times, him, Alex, and I, we'll, we'll get together in uh, a base. We rehearse in the basement of uh, Dave's father's house in Pasadena, and uh, we'll get like a case of beer or something, a tape recorder, and we just start playing, and we'll just play like a riff over and over, and it's like it develops out of that. And uh, Ted, who did our, uh, our latest album, too, Fair Warning, now it's gotten to the point where he's so close, he's almost like a fifth member of the band. And he'll come down and he'll listen to us play. And, uh, like, he has a, a really good ear for what, what sounds good and doesn't sound good. And, like, he really knows what we, you know, what's good for us. Not, not like, you know, what's good for Ted Bellman. And so he'll put his suggestions in. And uh, uh, we'll throw different pieces from old, old material that we'll play him that uh, we, we haven't used. Because we've still got uh, tons of material that uh, that we did on our actual first work tape that uh, has never been used. And so every once in a while we'll grab a little piece out of something and throw that in. And then everybody just starts, you know, kind of huddles in a circle and, and we play. And, whoa, 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 it's not here, you know, and somebody will hum something different. And, uh, has your method of recording changed during the different albums? No, not at all. How do you do you? Except that the new album took a little longer to record. It took, I think, about five weeks. Shameful. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, we, everything that we write and the way we always used to write, we always wrote it for live because, you know, even before we were recording, you know, there's no rhythm guitar or anything else there. And uh, we feel, you know, that if, you know, we still write like that, even though you've got all the wonders of the studio that you can use, you know, with all the millions of overdubbing. You know, stuff like that that you can use. 
it's you know the way we do it. We just still write live. Just go in and show. just go in and play. Yeah, man. We just go in and, and do it. And if we don't get it in like the first two or three takes, you know, the, we see no point to it because we don't want it coming out sounding like a uh, perfectly in tune thing. You know, after playing it so many times, or else, you know, we just don't want to burn out on it. So we just stop right there, go on to something else. Mm-hmm. We'll take a break and drink a beer or something. What are your favorite things that you've recorded? Uh, hmm. Let's see. Uh, well, from the new album, like uh, Mean Street, for like a straight-ahead rocker. And uh, I really like doing uh, Push Comes to Shove, because uh, I've been listening. Uh, Ed turned me on to uh, a group called Brand X, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with the bass player, with his name. Is it Gary Moore? Yeah, I'm not sure, but... Uh, I really got into his style of playing and stuff. So, like, at the very beginning of the song, I caught, like, a little, he's doing a lot of the mm-hmm. type stuff. And to, to me, that was really fun recording. And it, it was a lot, to me, that's the, a real different thing that we've done before. But still, it's got the Van Halen flavor, you know. Oh, definitely. When we, when we first heard it back, we just go, wow. Are, are there any um, other bass players you admire or who have been influential to you? Um, Shoot, I grew up listening to everybody. When I first started playing, I listened to a lot of blues, like session people like uh, Harvey Brooks, who played with Electric Flag. Electric Flag, I think he was the first blues bass player that I ever heard. When I bought that album, I think it was called Blue and Easy, something like that. And uh, from then, I just listened to everybody. I think I, uh, I played in the band for a while. We did a lot of blue cheer. I listened to their bass player, Dick Peterson. And uh, then I got into Cream. And Jack Bruce, I think Jack Bruce, between them, Jack Bruce and uh, Tim Bowler kind of influenced me the most, so my, like my rock style. What, um, what bands were you in just prior to Van Halen? No you, name bands at all. Really? Or no, yeah, no were recording you, thing. Were you in Mammoth? No. In fact, I got into Van Halen like a year after they named the group Van Halen. I, huh? think, huh? I think Dave had been in the band like a year before me. When did you get in? Uh, geez, I think it was... 74, right around there. We kind of like, uh, we all knew each other. Like, I'd be leaving a jazz class. I'd see Alex coming to his jazz class. Uh, Edward and I had uh, mutual friends that were, uh, you know, that knew us both that were in different classes with us. And uh, I just heard one day, uh, it was right, right after we played a show with him, I remember sitting having a beer talking to Ed in the parking lot of some high school in Gasolina. And him saying, yeah, we got to get together and jam sometime, whatever. And I say, yeah, sure, because I was just in a band. I, we were called Snake. And we were just doing, like, uh, parties and stuff like that. And so, like, a couple weeks later, I get a call from Ed saying that, uh, you know, this friend of mine, you know, turn me on to your number, and I'd like to know if you want to jam. And I d- didn't know it, that they were planning on getting rid of their bass player. But, so I went and played with Ed now for, like, three hours in a garage, little garage they were rehearsing, and I swear, they, they tried to put me through every beat change and offbeat thing that they could think of, and I caught them all. <laughs> uh, right after we were through playing, they just said, you want to join the band? And Great. I said, sure. What's the pressure like of becoming so famous so fast? Um, I don't even really think about stuff like that. It doesn't, like... You know, I, I really thank God that we didn't uh, happen real quick like a Boston or something like that, you know. Where yeah. all of a sudden you're just zoom right there. With, our, with us, it was more of like a, a, it was a steady thing, and not really fast. And uh, I think that that was, that was great for us because it didn't really affect anybody in the band. I don't even really think about it. Is, is it what you expected it would be? Success? Yeah, and more. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, everything that I always dreamed of wanting to do. And now that we're there, like, it just became so gradual, and all of a sudden we're here. I I never really thought about it. What are the, you know, people people have a real, young guys who want to become great bass players have have a good idea or an image of what it's like to be, what what the good parts of it are, but what are the disadvantages? Not getting enough sleep at night. <laughs> I can't. I can't even think of any any uh, negative things really. You know, it's all, it's all in everybody's head, and it's like how you uh, pace yourself 
and do it. Because as far as the playing goes, I'm having the time of my life. Dave, do you, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, as long as I can keep doing it, it's, you know, it's just all great for me. Do you play outside of the band? No. The only thing that I think that I ever do at all, uh, sometimes I get together with some friends that might be playing at a little club or a bar or something when we're off the road. Mm -hmm. come in and uh, jam like a set with them or something like that. I like to do that because, you know, to get like the different input from playing with other people. But like, I've never actually, you know, wanted to go out and actually play with somebody else. Um, I got to ask a couple of sort of technical questions here. Uh -oh. What kind of strings do you use? I use Roto Sound Round Wound. And uh, do you mainly play with down strokes? Uh, I play... Let's see, I play, are you talking about like with a pick? Do you use a pick mainly? I use, a, I use about a, I use a pick and my fingers about half a percent. And what are the differences in, in, in your uh, attack? Well, uh, with, a, with a pick, the reason that I usually use that is to get more of a, an attack on the bass. And if I'm doing a lot of chords during some stuff. And uh, I actually started playing bass with my fingers, so that's where I get all my speed from. So if I'm doing quicker things, then I play with my fingers. Do you, do you use any unusual techniques? Uh, not really, just the basic uh, two-finger uh, pluck. And then sometimes I like uh, I, I was getting in a little bit of funk-type playing for a while, so sometimes I'll throw a little bit of, you know, I'll slap it a few times with my thumb. Bootsy. Yeah. <laughs> the, the first band I got turned on to was uh, Mother's Finest. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Oh, sure. Like Moses. That. And, uh, I, met, I met the Wizard when we played in Atlanta a couple years ago. And I immediately went out and bought all their albums. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just, I got together with some friends and stuff, and they, they, we traded ideas. And uh, it's real fun. I mean, I haven't got any real vibrating fast thumb, but I, you know, I have a good time. And I apply a lot of that when we're playing, too. Now, so that's, that's really neat. Apply a lot of what? Oh, you know, a lot of the slapping and, you know, like, uh, uh, like I'll slap up my thumb and then use my third finger and pluck up from under the string. I'll slap around like that every now and then. Do you change your parts around on stage much? Mm, I, I'm not sure I catch what you're, what you're asking. Uh, like when you're backing up. Uh, oh, okay, like what I'm actually playing? Yeah. Uh, besides just a few things, like the basic things that we all do together, I never play the same thing twice. Your solos are different too? Yeah, that's always changing. Especially like, you know, we, we're just finishing up our third night here in Philly. And, you know, a lot of the people that I'm going to see tonight, probably in the front row, I've seen the last two nights. Uh, well, Eddie, I know Ed changes his stuff around a lot, too. Yeah. What What would you like to accomplish in the future? Uh, just to keep doing what we're doing right now. Would you have any advice you'd give to young rock and roll bassists? Yeah, just stick with it, no matter how hard it gets. Because we've hit some really bottom bottom times and uh, times where we thought that we'd always be playing in a club and have to always play other people's material. And, you know, you just got to stick to it. And, like, we just decided to make the break of playing original stuff. And a lot of bands do it, and they uh, lose a lot of money, so they go right back to playing clubs because that's, you know, that's where they think the money's at right there. And, uh, you know, I painted curbs for a while, numbers on house house numbers on curves and stuff. And, uh, you know, the basic, the main thing is just to stay with it. Hey, anything else you want to cover, Mike? Uh, I don't know. What about you? Well, I went through my, my list of questions. I got to kind of figure out what the, your fans want to know, you know? Uh-huh. And ask those questions. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know. They always come and tell me that they really like the way I jump on my face. I know. I, I was in the front row when you were doing that. I just, I was shocked. And it's, it's been a while since I saw something like this. Yeah, it's it's really weird because you know if you're going for the for the poll, you know, I see bass players like Gene Simmons up there, number one, you know, and like he's a decent bass player, but is not really my ideal bass player, you know. Who who's playing today that you think is really good?
so many different sounds all of a sudden harmonically that you can get out of that just playing with a fretted bass. And uh, Jock Pistorius, I always listen to his stuff. And uh, for rock, I don't know. Every now and then somebody pops out with something good, you know. But, uh, does it, do, you, do you feel that do the limitations in rock bother you? Uh, sometimes they do. But uh, yeah, I know I'm making Ed sound, you know, helping Ed sound good. And uh, there's a lot of times where I get frustrated where I can't play what I want to play. Or it'll, the other guys will say, well, why don't you just sit back and just play this, bom, bom, you know, and I'll kind of grip my teeth and go, well, okay. <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, it's, you know, it's really good. It's a little restricting playing behind a guitar player like Ed, but, you know, it feels good because of who he is, you know. Yeah, he sure is extraordinary. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Hey, it was a pleasure talking to you, Jack. I appreciate it. I'm going to be using Lowe's Hours pictures for this. Okay. Okay? Okay, great. Hey, if you think of anything else, give me a call. Sure, okay. Uh, Steve's uh, got your number there, right? Right. Road manager. Okay, great. Say hi to the boys for me. Okay, sure will. Hey, thanks. Okay, have a good day. Bye. Bye. Michael Anthony went on to play bass on seven more Van Halen albums. In 2006, he was permanently replaced by Eddie's son, Wolfgang. After that, Mike worked with former Van Halen vocalist Sammy Hagar in the band Chicken Foot, which featured Joe Satriani on, on guitar and Sammy Hagar in the circle. You can follow his exploits by visiting his Mad Anthony Cafe website. Before signing off, I want to thank Nick Hunt for producing my podcast, Steve Weiss and Shaw Lenz at the University of North Carolina Southern Folklife Collection, and especially all of my paid subscribers. Couldn't do it without you. This podcast is copyright 2022 by Jazz Obrecht, all rights reserved. <laughs>